Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you are. And I'd like to welcome you to this very last session of the 2019 Virtual Island Summit. So far, this event has been a terrific way to share experiences and approaches to island-specific issues from around the world, and I hope this session will be no different. My name is Kristen Deason, and I'm the Caribbean representative for the Global Green Growth Institute, or GGGI for short. I'm based here at the OECS Commission headquarters in St. Lucia, where we've been running a joint program with OECS, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, since May of this year. Prior to that, I worked as a regional officer with GGI's specific program in Fiji, so I have some experience with both of the initiatives that we'll be discussing today. So this panel is entitled, Regional Approaches to Supporting NDC Implementation and Enhancement, Lessons Learned from the Caribbean and the Pacific. Before we start, I'd like to offer a bit of background so that our audience is all on the same page. For example, what is an NDC, you may ask? Well, that's a good question. NDC stands for Nationally Determined Contribution, and this represents the commitment that each country has made to reduce its carbon emissions and adapt to the impacts of climate change. These contributions are at the heart of the implementation of the Paris Agreement, which, as you know, aims to set the world on a course towards sustainable development and targeted at limiting global warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels. The Paris Agreement requires each country to prepare, communicate, and maintain successive nationally determined contributions, or NDCs, that it intends to achieve. Most countries have already prepared and submitted an NDC and are in the process of implementing it, but the Paris Agreement also asks countries to update and enhance their NDCs every five years. So many countries are in the process of developing updated NDCs that will be submitted in 2020. And if you're interested in learning about your country's NDC, there's actually a really good tool available online that the NDC partnership has developed. And I'll try to paste the link in the comments in just a couple of minutes, but basically you can look up any country and it tells you what's in that NDC and what the status of it is. All right, so this brings me to our, our panel topic. So small island countries in the Caribbean and the Pacific have placed a high importance on implementing and expanding their NDCs in part because island countries are special, especially vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And in both areas, regional initiatives have been set up in recent years to offer countries support in achieving these goals. The NDC Finance Initiative in the Caribbean and the Pacific NDC Hub in the Pacific. Today's panel includes representatives from both hubs as well as government representatives from both regions. I hope our discussion will be instructive in what these initiatives are doing to support countries, what they need to do in the future, and how these two regions can learn from each other and continue to collaborate as their work develops. So while I introduce the panelists, I'd like to ask James to put up our two first audience polling questions. So these are just some demographic questions. We want to get an idea of um, who here who's in the audience and who we're talking to. So the first one is, what region are you from or which region you're working in? So answer that question, please, if you would. And then the second question will come up in a minute, which is, what sector are you from? So while everyone's doing that, let me go ahead and introduce our panelists. So right next to me in the room with me here is Chris, Crispin Dovern. He's the Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management Coordinator for OECS, and he's representing the NDC Finance Initiative uh, in the Caribbean. And we also have, in another window, Annette Leo from St. Lucia. Annette is the Chief Sustainable Development and Environment Officer in the Sustainable Development and Environment Division, Department of Sustainable Development in the Ministry of Education, Innovation, Gender Relations, and Sustainable Development of St. Lucia. And I think, Annette, you have the longest job title. I've ever seen. So, <laughs> congratulations. Um, across uh, the globe, on the other side of the world, we have two representatives from Fiji. We have Nilesh Prakash, Head of Climate Change and International Cooperation in the Fiji Ministry of Economy. And we have Vincent Ginadu, who is a Senior Green Investment Specialist at GGGI. And Vincent is embedded within the Pacific NDC Hub's implementation unit. So we have some great, great representation and looking forward to a good conversation here. 
Okay, let's take a look at the results of the polling questions. So actually it looks like we've got pretty even representation between the Caribbean and the Pacific. We've got about 30% from each region um, and then about 23% from North America, some people from Latin America and a few from Europe. Okay, all right, great. And if you would, especially for the people from the Caribbean and the Pacific, if you wouldn't mind putting into the chat um, which specific country you're from or which country you're working in, we would be really interested in, in seeing that so we know which countries are represented. And I think people are already doing that. Let's see here. Okay, all right, great. All right, so our next poll is coming up. Which sector best describes you? So again, we're trying to get a sense of uh, what type of companies and organizations are represented here. So if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and put down which sector you're from. And then we'll get to our panelist questions. So while you're answering that question, I'll just sort of describe our, our agenda here today. Um, first, I'm going to ask each panelist to speak for about five to ten minutes um, on the questions that I'll ask you. And a couple of our panelists have slides that you'll be able to look at while they're speaking. And then we'll have some follow-up questions. Um, for those in the audience, please feel free to submit questions via Zoom in the Q&A box. Um, there's a chat box and a Q&A box, but I, I guess it would be better if people submit questions in the, in the Q&A. We'll be able to see them more easily. Um, we won't get to the, the audience questions until the end of the broadcast, but feel free to put them in at any time and we'll get to them. Okay, so let's see what sectors we have here. It looks like we have the most people from the development sector, 25%, but we've got pretty good rep representation from the other sectors as well. We've got some people from academia, some from the private sector, public sector, nobody from utility, um, and some people from others. So if you put other, maybe you can say in the chat box who you're representing. All right, thank you very much, audience. Great to have you here. All right, so now we're gonna move on and have our, our panelists tell us a little bit about what they've been doing. So I'm gonna start with Annette. Again, Annette is from the government of St. Lucia. And Annette, if you could give us a brief overview of where St. Lucia is with your NDC implementation and enhancement. Uh, tell us what's been done so far and what are the next steps that you're aiming for. And also if you could talk about what areas you're looking to regional hubs to help with uh, for support in implementing your NDCs and what you think is the role of the country government versus the role of the hub. Annette? Thank you very much and good evening colleagues or good morning. I'm not sure where you are, but certainly it's a pleasure for me to be part of this panel. Um, I'll just jump in it, into it quickly because I know we don't have much time. Um, I am the NDC focal point for um, St. Lucia and I work within the Department of Sustainable Development, which is the focal point for in NDC implementation. We view the implementation of the NDC as a multi-agency approach, notwithstanding that we have that specific mandate. Given that St. Lucia has a conditional um, NDC, Implementation definitely requires extensive uh, financial and technical support, which has to be sourced, but it has to be done in a way that is um, consistent with our country's bilateral and multilateral financial support uh, protocols. Um, so for this reason, we work very closely with the economic development and finance department in St. Lucia. And we brought these two departments specifically on board when we formed what we call our NDC multi-agency support team. As I indicated, it's not just the responsibility of the Department of Sustainable Development, but ensuring that we have that whole of government approach, we formed this team. One of the activities that was critical um, to this team was the development of St. Lucia's NDC partnership plan. And this is a plan which comprises over 40 projects, both ongoing and planned. And we also were able to get it endorsed at the cabinet level. And what we have done so far, we were able to share this plan with existing and uh, potential partners to determine possible um, funding and technical support. Um, basically, this plan is our instrument to, that we use to attract support for implementation efforts and we are constantly searching for support in terms of 
um, what we can do, what can be implemented at the national level, what possibilities there are. And of course, this is a plan that we make available um, to whoever is interested. So basically, since we submitted our NDC in 2015 and moving forward towards 2018, where we were able to um, gain support through the NDC partnership, we were able to move into the development of this plan, working very closely with other agencies with regard to seeing how much we can um, implement the efforts within the, the plan. With regard to how we plan to move forward, um, right now, St. Lucia is in what we call the NDC revision mode, um, trying as much as possible to make preparations for the revision of our NDC in order to make a timely submission prior to COP26. Um, for the revision, we were able to source support through the NDC Partnership Climate Action um, Enhancement Package. And we expect that actual revision work will begin in sometime in December. The support of this um, enhancement package will help us to determine the scope of enhancement that St. Lucia will undertake in terms of its NDC revision. While we want to remain um, ambitious in our commitments, we need to keep them manageable or reasonable, keeping our circumstances in focus. And we envisage that our enhancement will be by way of increasing the sectors to be included in the revised um, NDC. We are not looking at uh, increasing our targets. So while there have been some movement with implementing a few of the interventions within the partnership plan, not being able to make the dent that we wanted um, with regard to our targets, we believe this is an indication that we need to focus on improving the scope of our interventions from a sector um, perspective. So with the revision process, um, we're aiming to have a uh, a process where there is greater stakeholder involvement, both public and private sector. We want to have more political involvement and awareness of NDC implementation. And we want to have a better economic or fiscal analysis. So these are some of the areas that we believe we didn't do too well on when we developed our initial um, NDC in 2015. Um, Christine, with regard to what our expectations are um, in terms of the regional hubs and implementing our NDC, I think one of the things that we could um, look at is with respect to some kind of support where technical matchmaking for implementation experience is concerned. Um, I think there's a need for us to have that kind of exchange experience with the other countries within the hubs. Um, understanding the various lessons learned um, throughout implementation, the challenges. Um, this type of in, um, information can help us as implementers put us in a better place when pursuing efforts because there is no need for us to be reinventing the wheels in what we are doing. And I think also another area of support could be by way of um, finance support related matchmaking or guidance in terms of best practices or approaches for investors, especially um, from the private sector within the, the two regions that we're looking at. Um, at the national level, in terms of you know, what the country can do, what the role of the country government um, is um, versus that of the hub, at the national level, um, there needs to be prioritization of the sectors for development and um, implementation of NDC-related measures. This must be very clear. And I believe this can be um, some kind of demonstration from the government of its true commitment to achieving um, our targets. I believe also at the national level, there needs to be clear support for the institutional arrangements that are necessary for um, NDC implementation. And there is need um, to encourage investments for by making sure, for example, that we have um, adequate legislation and policies in place that will attract our investors or, or entities, um, development partners who are willing to support the country in terms of what we're aiming to achieve with regard to NDC implementation. Um, yes, our NDCs are conditional, but it doesn't mean that we have to sit and wait for this kind of support to come to us. We need to create that kind of environment that will show our investors, our partners, that we are making the effort that is needed to advance the implementation of our NDCs um, interventions that we have 
uh, committed ourselves. So I think in a nutshell, that is what I think the country can do, um, what we expect from the, the various hubs, um, what we're going to do in terms of our next steps, and what we have done in terms of our implementation efforts. Thank you. mentioned matchmaking with um, finances from the financial side, but by technical matchmaking, do you mean technical assistance in the particular sectoral areas of the NDC that you're looking to expand the NDC into? I think I missed the first part of your question. You weren't coming across clearly. Christine, could you repeat? Sorry. Sorry, sorry. I was just curious what you meant by technical matchmaking. Because you mentioned technical matchmaking, but then you also mentioned matchmaking with respect to bringing in financing for a specific project. So by the technical matchmaking, did you mean you know, help with the specific uh, additional sectors that you are looking to expand your NDCs into? So basically like the hub bringing in technical experts to help with that? Yes. Um, implementation of our NDC doesn't always mean financial support because of our constraints with manpower and the various um, responsibilities that some of the agencies um, have, it is not always possible to dedicate that kind of focus that you, you want to, to have towards a specific program area. So with regard to technical um, matchmaking, this is re with regard to, as you indicated, um, experts being able to ass be assigned to the various countries based on what we are working on. If there's a specific focus on a particular um, sector, then you could have sector expertise being assigned to the countries. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in-country presence, physical presence, but also virtual um, assignment and support as well. OK, great. Thank you very much for that clarification. All right, I'm going to move now to Nilesh Prakash. Nilesh, it's, it's great to see you. Nilesh and I used to work together in Fiji, and I haven't seen him for a while, so great to see your smiling face there. Um, Nilesh, could you give us a similar overview of where Fiji is with respect to NDC implementation and with enhancement? Uh, can you tell us what's been done so far? What are the next steps you're aiming for? And also, what areas are you looking to regional hubs to help support you in implementing your NDCs? And what do you think the role is of the country government versus that of the regional initiative? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and very good morning. And my apologies for uh, coming in late. I mean, it's a wet day in Suva and I have babysitter, babysitter issues. So uh, my apologies. Uh, but, but Christine, you know, very good to see you. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really uh, very pleased to be participating in this, uh, you know, zero emission um, summit. It's, it's a very, very good one. And I think, you know, when uh, the idea first was mooted and I think, you know, Vincent came across that, you know, uh, you know, we'd like you to, uh, to participate in this. I was really, really excited because uh, over the last, I would say a couple of years, you know, I've been, I've been attending summits and meetings, but again, you know, I've been victim. I've been a, uh, you know, sort of a, um, uh, a uh, you know, because, Obviously, we have to travel, you know, to, to quite a distance, you know, to be able to um, to participate in this. But I think this is a good good modality, and I think you know we should be you know, encouraging this. And again, good to see you. And uh, again, um, very good to see that you know you in your new role, you know, you you're connecting, you know, the Caribbean region, and you know you're connecting uh, us uh, with with with, uh, with us here in the Pacific. And I think very 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 good. Um, um, you know, subject matter we are discussing as well this morning. And in terms of, you know, the NDC, um, NDCs for Fiji. So, you know, we, we do have a um, renewable energy commitment to move towards 100% renewable by 2030. So that was, um, that, uh, that was our initial NDC commitment. And I think uh, in, in many respects, you know, we've done so many analysis, you know, since having committed that first um, NDC, we've realized that, that that was, you know, for a small developing, uh, island developing country, I think that's that's a big commitment to move towards you know 100% renewable. So, um, um, you know, obviously, I think you know it is well understood that you know most um, uh, most countries and in in most regions, you know, the initial NDCs were quite rushed, you know, and and so uh, so was ours. And I think 
the, the good thing we've done, um, you know, having made that commitment was to do an NDC implementation roadmap. And we were very fortunate to, you know, to have partnered with the Global Green Growth Institute, um, you know, to, to actually deliver that. And I think having gone through that roadmap and that sort of, you know, unpacking exercise, then meant to us, you know, you know it, it really provided that clarity that we've made a big commitment, but how are we actually going to achieve that? And I think that was a fundamental step. And I think, you know, any country who wishes to sort of go down the path of NDC implementation needs to do an unpacking exercise, you know, to really understand, you know, what they've committed and what it takes for them to, to uh, uh, you know, to, to achieve that. So that's the NDC, NDC you know, the, the, the um, you know, ro roadmap uh, processes. But again, I think, you know, another fundamental step that we have, um, you know, also begun, and this is again, you know, with the NDC regional hub, as you may know, this is a regional, uh, you know, vehicle, which is helping, you know, specific countries to, to look at NDC, um, you know, uh, implementation, NDC investment planning, NDC enhancement, and all that, you know, sort of works related to NDCs, you know, capacity building, uh, you know, at the national level and all that, you know, sort of all works. So with the NDC hub, you know, we're getting support to do our NDC investment plans. So I think, you know, with the focus on renewable energy um, sector, and, and I think, you know, understanding the dynamics of the local sort of, you know, energy company, which has undergone, you know, di you know partial divestment and, and, and there's more to sort of, you know, come, uh, you know, with the local energy company there. So I think, you know, it, it, it only makes sense that, you know, we need to be able to, uh, you know, project our indices in, in, in a manner, you know, which is attract, attractive to investors, you know, and, and particularly if we want, you know, private sector investment in, uh, uh, in renewable energy projects. So this is the, uh, the process which we are currently, um, um, you know, looking at, which is NDC implementation, uh, um, sorry, NDC investment plans. You know, we're working uh, with the NDC regional hub. And again, you know, we have the good collaboration from the, uh, uh, Institute on that. Um, in, in terms of, um, you know, what we are hoping for in, in, in particularly the aspect of NDC enhancement, I think we all know, we all understand that, you know, parties are given, um, you know, 2020 as the timeline to, you know, to, to raise the ambition and the mitigation ambition of the NDCs. I think, you know, looking at our NDCs, I mean, it's, it's in itself is quite ambitious, you know, 30% GHG reduction. Uh, you know, by 2030. And I think, uh, you know, because most of, of, of these commitments are conditional and, you know, it, a lot depends on the local sort of, you know, the regulatory environment, the investment environment, and, and how we in, in, in fact generate a lot of these investments. So I think, you know, you know, having said that, you know, our indices are already quite ambitious. So when it comes to enhancement, I mean, there is obviously you know, a perspective of uh, ready, raising the, the, the goal, uh, you know, the goal post, so which means essentially we could have one option was, you know, we could have um, raised our target from 30% to something else, maybe 35 or 40%. But whilst that was an option, I think we've also done some interim analysis and which points us, in, you know, and, and really highlights the fact that, you know, because our economy has been growing for the last 10 years, our emissions are also rising. So I think, you know, we, we are trading very carefully in this space, you know, we don't want to raise the target. But alternatively, as, as, um, as part of the NDC enhancement process, what we want to do is to look at various other initiatives that will help us achieve the initial, uh, you know, 30% target. Say, for example, you know, we're looking, you know, taking deep dives into the maritime transportation sector, what are our potential, you know, mitigation sources? You know, we're looking at, you know, the wider sort of, you know, transportation sector, for example, you know, and, and, and how this can perhaps, you know, um, help us achieve, you know, that 30% um, target, you know, by 2030. We're also looking at, you know, energy efficiency. I think, you know, it's an under-invested in area, and I think there's a lot of potential with that, you know, particularly with the, um, you know, uh, housing and construction boom in the country. So I think there's there's a lot of opportunities to look at, you know, the uh, the energy efficiency side of things. So this is, you know, when it comes to NDC enhancement, you know, we are working with a technical institute in India. So we want to be able to pull all this together, and, and this will then become our sort of narrative in terms of how we wish to, you know, uh, at least enhance our NDC with more, you know, uh, initiatives. And we're also coming up with our um, uh, climate legislation as well. I mean, Christine and uh, 
and, and the rest of the team. I mean, if you haven't had a chance to comment on the climate bill, I mean, please, you know, I mean, I can send you the hyperlink, you know, download the, uh, you know, the draft bill and com uh, comment on it. I mean, the comments which we are receiving on the climate bill is that, you know, it's, it's very progressive. You know, so it's it's actually you know in a way you know it's it's, it's making um, you know it's it's compelling the industries to report on emission emissions. It's also uh, making a, a legal commitment. We are making a legal commitment, you know, of uh, not net zero by 2050, and then which of course means that you know we have to achieve you know the, the targets we have set for uh, um, you know uh, for uh, for 2030. So in a nutshell, these are the number of initiatives you know we we have in place you know particularly in terms of you know enhancement what we are looking at how we are looking at enhancement uh, of our NDC and, and 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 noting very well that we have a 2020 you know timeline for uh, for us to submit that and i think you know fiji is of course you know one of the very progressive countries in the region you know we've made a commitment to net uh, net zero by 2050 so i think you know it does make a lot of sense that you know we we take you know some very uh, crucial and fundamental steps towards you know um, realizing our 2030 target and then of course you know um, the uh, the pathway towards 2050 um, the next question which you um, highlighted if you want me to go at it now i can i can answer that is, is that all right yeah yeah go ahead about the hubs right that's nice yes. yeah please okay great and i think um See, this is a, a great initiative, and and the way I see, you know, every every international forum that I go to, I carry this, uh, you know, uh, catalog of of the NDC hub, you know, promoting this because this is, I think, uh, I mean, of course, this was born out of you know Fiji's presidency of COP23, but I think. Um, you know what's what's crucial about this is that this was a call from the region uh you know regional ministers so the regional ministers you know they call us at, at at one of the gatherings here in suva you know so this was a prelude to our cop 23 presidency and i think the fundamental thing about that was we wanted to focus we wanted to meet and we wanted to understand what are the regional priorities i mean fiji is a small island developing country a vulnerable climate vulnerable country you know, it was taking charge of, uh, you know, the global negotiations on climate change, you know, it, that was a co-presidency. So we obviously needed to understand, you know, what are the priorities from the region. And, and, and so the Climate Action Pacific Partnership, um, the event we had in June of 2017, then resulted in discussions on a regional facility. And, and, and we are very humbled by, you know, the, the generous um, sort of, um, you know, financial contributions, the initial contributions from governments of Germany, UK, Australia also made, a, you know, some financial commitment. And very soon, you know, this, this all sort of, you know, took shape and, and there was a regional hub which is now operational. And of course, you know, Vincent, you know, who's also part of the panel, you know, is, is one of those, you know, resource persons um, at the regional hub. So I think in terms of the um, the um, uh, the promises, I would say, of the regional hub, of course, you know, we now have a regional facility, which, you know, um, uh, you know which is very dedicated to looking at regional, um, you know, indices. I mean, we don't have any dedicated um, um, either UN agency or any other development agency, you know, who is perhaps not looking at, you know, our regional indices in a very dedicated manner. So I think, you know, just because this is a commitment, I mean, it's a Paris commitment and, you know, we all have made um you know commitment to to to, to do um you know um uh, our bit in terms of emissions reduction but i think fundamentally you know the, uh, you know we've got to also embrace you know what science is telling us science is very clear you know we have very limited time to make progress so as you know climate vulnerable countries you know as specific seeds although we're not big on emissions but we do have a part to play you know, and also when we talk about climate action, you know, there's adaptation and resilience side of things. So I think, you know, um, with that in mind, I think, you know, we do have, uh, you know, a lot of um, expectations from the regional hub. I mean, as it is, the regional hub itself has, you know, made, um, uh, is, is very busy with delivering on, on the commitments um, uh, or rather the requests from, from countries in the region, like for instance, you know, they're helping you know, Fiji and Kiribati, and I think Vanuatu as well, you know, on NDC implementation plans. You know, they're looking at, you know, other countries who have requested the hub to, you know, perhaps, you know, deliver the NDC uh, 
uh, you know, roadmaps for them. And then of course, you know, there's this, um, you know, uh, particular exercise that which is about NDC enhancement. Again, very technical. I think, you know, we need to do a long-term um, uh, emissions reduction, uh, you know, pathway planning for us to be able to make any further commitments on that. So I think these are some of the fundamental, you know, technical aspects, you know, which the hub is, you know, charged with. And I think, you know, personally, I think that, you know, uh, beyond the first phase of uh, of the work of the hub, of the hub, I think there is there there, there is crucially uh, you know work on 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 finance on on coming up with a climate finance strategy for you know individual countries or even like you know looking at you know block of countries in the region. I think there is there is also opportunities for the hub to look at some of the legal impediments. You know what are the legal sort of barriers to NDC implementation. Um, looking at capacity building issues you know uh, building on the um, you know delivering on the paris agreement does require you know specific you know sort of capacities um you know at, at the country level at the national level so i think you know again the hub could take a very lead role in you know um, crucial role in that, you know, in terms of facilitating capacity building. Legal issues, like I said, you know, uh, many countries, you know, for example, they have their electricity X. I mean, particularly if they are looking at, you know, renewable energy, I think the act also needs to be, you know, looked at, you know, because uh, at least in the in the Fijian case, I mean, it did not allow for independent power producers. So I think, you know, we've got to look at some of these legal impediments to, uh, uh, you know, to, to investment in renewable energy. Uh, again, I think, you know, in terms of financing, very important space. And I think, you know, just because, uh, you know, the indices in the region are, uh, in the region are conditional, I think we've got to, uh, you know, be, uh, be very proactive in this space. How can we then, you know, sort of tweak our own sort of fiscal spaces to, you know, create room for some, you know, domestic investments in, uh, you know, four, four indices. How can we then, you know, sort of leverage on the domestic finance to be able to crowd in, you know, perhaps private sector finance, you know, for in, uh, investment in indices. And, and I think having said that, there's again, you know, now the adaptation fund is of course, you know, serving the Paris Agreement. There's huge opportunities for the hub to sort of, you know, build capacity and work with accredited entities, you know, to be able to, you know, um, uh, you know, tap into you know the, the the finance which is available with the adaptation fund, and of course, you know the GCF in a big way. We need to build capacity um, uh, within within governments, within within uh, ministries of planning and finance, you know, to be able to uh, to tap into the global public finance, particularly with the GCF resources. For instance, you know, we are working with the global in, in a green growth institute to get the Ministry of um, Economy accredited to the Green Climate Fund. So I think this is a fundamental step. And I think, you know, if anything, we want to get into that space. You know, I mean, we're not looking at like, you know, um, big size grants, like, you know, 40, 50 million, but I think, you know, achievable size, you know, things that we can run with. And, and, um, and I think um, it does make a lot of sense, you know, because as a central agency, we do have, you know, a, a role to coordinate within government, you know, particularly on projects, on financing. So I think it does make a lot of sense that, you know, we, we get ourselves accredited and then, you know, um, use that opportunity to, to, to um, you know, to tap into the uh, GCF resources. So I'll, I'll stop there unless you have, you know, um, um, you know, any, any further questions for me. And I think, um, you know, in terms of the priority areas, I said legal impediments, finance, uh, you know, capacity building, all these things, you know, so I think, you know, this is something, you know, in as much as, you know, um, these efforts need to be driven by government, but I think at some stage, then there has to be some sort of handholding and for which, you know, we're very glad that there's a regional, you know, vehicle, which is, you know, sort of thinking in this space, you know, guiding us in this space. And, you know, we have, you know, and, and I think um, the other last point, you know, and then I'll stop there, I wanted to mention is that I think having a regional vehicle is important because that then allows us to learn, learn from our peers. Like for example, the work which we have done, and I think you know, a lot of you know, these countries recognize us you know, as, um, I don't wanna use the word leaders, but at least you know, very progressive in terms of you know, policy, in terms of thinking, in terms of driving um, you know, investments uh, uh, you know, towards indices. So I think there's a lot of you know, opportunities for peer learning, for example, looking at the legal readiness we did, looking at the indices 
implementation and roadmap with it, you know, looking at the work we were doing on investment planning. So they think that I think, you know, with these experiences, there's a lot of, you know, regional peer-to-peer -peer sort of learning, you know, that can be done. And I think this is something, you know, which, you know, once we build our capacity, we are then able to sort of emulate that in different contexts within the region and not necessarily then depend on international TA. So I think, again, uh, you know, a very, um, cost-effective means of, you know, of, of imparting knowledge and of, of building capacity within the region. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Nilesh. Um, well, it's, it's interesting hearing what, what Annette was talking about and what you were talking about. I think both of you touched on similar things when you were speaking about, you know, what you're looking for under regional initiatives to help with support. You mentioned um, finance strategies, um, helping address legal impediments, capacity building, peer learning, and Annette had mentioned technical support, lessons learned, exchanging lessons learned, basically the same thing as peer learning, financial guidance, matchmaking support. So I think you're, so you're, it sounds like you're both on the same page. And of course, peer learning is the reason why we're here today, not just do, doing peer learning um, among countries in the same region, but from one region to another. So at this point, let's hear from representatives from the, the regional initiatives and tell us how they're trying to address these requests from the countries. So we're gonna start with Crispin Dover, who's right here next to me again with OECS and representing the NDCFI. So I'm, Crispin actually has some slides he's gonna show, so I'm gonna put those up. And while I'm doing that, I just wanna remind everybody, I know people have been writing some questions into the chat box. Um, if you have questions that you'd like the panelists to speak to, please put those in the Q&A. There's actually, um, I think on your Zoom screen, there should be a separate box where you click Q&A and, and the box will come up and you can type your questions there. All right, just give me one second to share the screen here. Share screen. And this one, right? Okay, take it away, Christian. Can minimize this so you can see? There you go. Thanks, Christine. And hello, everyone, whatever part of the world you're in. It's night, morning. Hello. Okay, hold on. Let me just click the screen so it gets. Sorry. Okay, let's see. <laughs> and then it should. Load. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> We're fighting over okay. the keyboard here. There you go. <laughs> just to put things in context, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, or OECS. It was established in 1981, and it is an intergovernmental international organization dedicated to economic harmonization and integration, protection of human and legal rights, and the encouragement of good governance among independent and non-independent member countries, independent countries of Eastern Caribbean. Now, the full member states of the OECS are Antigua and Barbuda, the Commonwealth of Dominica, Grenada, Montserrat, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And the associate members are the British Virgin Islands of BVI, Anguilla, Martinique, Guadeloupe, and St. Martin, French St. Martin, is an associate member. Sorry, it's, it's an observer. Now, when you, looked at, when you look at the NDCs of the respective member states, now, only the independent member states are in a position to submit NDCs. The, you will notice that the the end that if you look at you notice that for Antigua, for example, the estimates that were put in the first NDC, the initial NDC was 220 million. Now, as was said by a previous speaker, many of the NDCs were rushed, so these figures could well be um, inaccurate. They could actually be higher than what was initially estimated. Some countries did not put in estimates. For example, you notice St. Kitts and Nevis didn't put in and a figure, a cost for the, the mitigation. And most countries did not put in a figure or cost for the adaptation. In fact, most of them didn't have adaptation targets. So, but the figures that we do have, you'll see that 698 million US for mitigation, adaptation from one country, 200 million. So, but if we already had everybody in, and if we had all the figures, we'd probably be looking somewhere in the region of $2 billion or something like that. Now, the key sectors were, that were energy and transport, water, coastal ecosystems, agriculture and food security, the built environment, human health, tourism, 
waste management and land use management also were, were mentioned in most NDCs. And by the way, COI stands for cost of implementation. All right. Now, the OECS Commission has endeavored to support member states in their efforts to accelerate NDC implementation. And the first, the fourth OECS Council of Ministers for Environmental Sustainability, COMS4 of 2017, noted the critical importance of pursuing NDC implementation in fulfillment of obligations under the Paris Agreement. The Council also noted the potential benefits of a collective and strategic sub regional approach to NDC implementation. It endorsed the Commission's efforts to pursue and secure technical and financial support for regional NDC implementation, including through the convening of a regional NDC forum, and also endorsed the Commission's efforts to pursue support for complementary efforts on the part of the United Kingdom overseas territories. These countries, the BVI, Montserrat, Anguilla, are not in a position to submit NDCs on their own because they're not independent, but they have the, the efforts, they have aspirations with regard to climate change, which are confluent with the spirit of the NDCs. And it's worth noting that the ministerial mandate provided that comes forward endorsed by the Fifth Council of Ministers in 2018. So based on, on the, the mandate from the Council of Ministers, in 2017, the OECS and the government of St. Lucia, in partnership with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNFCCC Secretariat, with initial support from GIZ and under the auspices of the NDC partnership, embarked on an initiative to accelerate any NDC implementation. With technical support from GIZ, the Caribbean NDC Finance Initiative, or NDCFI, was launched in St. Lucia in September 2017. Working groups were established to support the NDS CFI in three initial thematic areas, namely energy, including transport, water, and other critical infrastructure. So what then is the NDC Finance Initiative, or NDCFI? The NDCFI is a regional cross-sector and multi-partite stakeholder consultation and engagement process to support ambitions of climate leadership in the Caribbean. A regional platform for learning and support on project preparation and access to finance to accelerate NDC implementation and complementary action, as I described earlier. The NDCFI seeks to facilitate inclusive participation in shaping climate-driven transformation across the OECS to build capacity, commitment, and collaboration for climate action and policy harmonization. So just bottlenecks in project development and increase the availability of investable projects to improve access to finance for projects that accelerate NDC implementation and build resilience, and to establish a regional hub at the OECS for NDC-related information and support, peer learning, coordination on policy challenges, and an inventory of NDC-related initiatives, tools, and capacity. The first NDC forum convened in St. Lucia on 11th and 12th October 19, um, 2018, sorry, and focused on opportunities to mobilize financial support for and catalyze investment in NDC and complementary action in the region. Support for hosting of the event was provided by the Caribbean Development Bank, the UNDP, GIZ, UNFCCC, NDC Partnership, World Bank, the EU ACP, and the Government of the Republic of China and Taiwan. It brought together ministers and other high-level delegates, public sector experts from nine OECS member states and the wider Caribbean community, other technical experts, Caribbean and international investors, development partners, regional institutions, and it identified a number of critical areas for further action, including project pipeline development, capacity building, and private sector engagement. Based on the outcomes of the forum, the following priorities were identified for 2019-2020 capacity building, project pipeline development, and access to finance, including from the private sector, continuing and enhancing the working group process, pursuing collaboration and alignment opportunities with other initiatives in the region and beyond, and convening a second forum to showcase results of activities delivered under the NDCFI, and progress towards establishing a regional NDC consultation, support, and learning platform at the OECS. With regard to progress, 
I have outlined some of the areas where we've, we've made some, some progress. Uh, we made significant progress, I'd say. So one of the first activities we held in 2020, 2019 was a training workshop on, on the source online project development and management platform. This workshop was held in March 2019 and attended by representatives from nine member states and the OCS Commission. And that was made possible through uh, an agreement between GIZ, the Caribbean Development Bank of CDB, and the OECS. As part of that package, interested member states and the commission were granted no cost access to the source platform upon submission of a formal request to the Sustainable Infrastructure Foundation, SIF. Over the last few months, two consultants have worked with four member states, that is St. Vincent and the Grenadines, St. Lucia, St. Kitts and Nevis, and the Commonwealth of Dominica to develop one concept note each for submission to the Green Climate Fund or Adaptation Fund through, again, that same GICCDB OECS agreement. The concept notes were recently validated just on, on Monday and Tuesday of this week at a peer review meeting where everybody came together, the, the, the concept notes were presented and we got feedback with a view to finalizing these concept notes before submission to the relevant um, funding agency. The, uh, the working group plenary meeting which we had planned was convened successfully in July, again through the support of GIZ, and that's the working groups on water, energy including transport, and other critical infrastructure. The second NDC forum has been scheduled for March 2020 in partnership with PFAN, that's a private finance advisory network, and Get Invest. And work is underway to brand and raise awareness of the NDCFI. We are also working with under the UNFCCC um, needs-based financing initiative to undertake a, 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 an NBF assessment for the OECS. And um, certainly our partnerships with Get Invest and PFAN are, are really intended to, to more significantly and, and, and profoundly engage the private sector. So with this, I'm going to say thank you. I shall stop here. You will notice the the recently launched logo for the NDC Finance Initiative. So the left in the left hand corner of your of the screen, and on the right hand corner you will see the URL for the um, the second NDC forum, the web page, which is being developed. You know, as as time progresses, we more material is being added. So that forum will be held. 16th to 20th of March 2020, again in St. Lucia. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you, Crispin. And actually, I hadn't seen that logo yet. <laughs> Let's be brand new. Looks, there you go. <laughs> looks really nice. Well, uh, thank you very much for that overview of the NBC Finance Initiative. So now we're going to go back to the Pacific and hear from Vincent Kinadu. And Vincent has some slides too, so we'll try to get those up here. Um, so Vincent, could you tell us, uh, give us some similar information about the, the Pacific NDC hub. So who are the partners? When was it started? What have you accomplished so far? What are you planning in the future? And what areas of support to, to the countries are your current focus? How is the hub helping with them? And also why was the regional initiative needed? Why was it started up? Let me get your slides right here. Oops, hold on. Okay, the slide should be coming up. All right, Vincent, floor is yours. Thank you. Can you can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Okay, excellent. Uh, can can you go to the the first slide, please? So the the next one. Thank you. Um, so um, Nilesh has mentioned a lot because he has been working on uh, on, on the so with the, the Pacific and Sea Hub uh, since its inception. So I'll, uh, I'll I'll repeat some stuff and try to to add some uh, other components from uh, the uh, NDC Hub perspective. Uh, so so that's can you go to the previous slide, please? Christine? Yes, this one, thank you. Um, so as Nishnilesh mentioned, the, the Pacific Island countries requested in 2017 the establishment of the Pacific Andesi Hub. 
they requested this support to help them update and enhance their indices by 2020 and to implement those indices. And as you know, uh, the Pacific Island countries' contribution to CO2 emissions are very low, but they want to show leadership with high NDC ambitions, showing that they are at the forefront of climate mitigation. The, um, so in terms of setting up the, the Pacific NDC Hub, it has 15 member countries, as you, as you can see on, on, on this page. And there is a steering committee composed of Fiji as host country and of three focal points representing the three Pacific sub-regions. Samoa, Vanuatu, and Palau. Uh, the steering committee has a critical role in the NDC hub. It supervises the progress of the, of the hub and it provides guidance and directions. There are also uh, five implementation partners, uh, GIZ, GGGI, SPC, SPREP, so which are two uh, Pacific regional organizations, and NDC partnership. GIZ is the lead partner and they provide financing for all the NDC hub activities and all the partners provide staff who work within the NDC hub implementation unit. Uh, in terms of funding, so the, uh, there are four donors who channel their funds through GIZ, so it's Germany, Australia, the United Kingdom and uh, New Zealand. And uh, the NDC Hub started its operations uh, in 2018, and it has now started to deliver on specific country requests. Uh, on the next slide. Christine, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Is, it, is it that one that you already showed, or you want me to go to the one after that? It's this one, yes. Okay. Um, so, Christine, you asked what areas of support uh, the NDC Hub is uh, focusing on. The, uh, the supports uh, that the, the Hub provides can be grouped into three main categories. First, we support the NDC updates and enhancements that must submitted by 2020. Second, we support the implementation of the NDCs, so with um, preparing NDC implementation roadmaps, investment plans, project pipelines, and also to monitor and report the NDCs with MRV systems. And third, we organize workshops and trainings to share knowledge and experience among Pacific countries. Uh, then, um, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so uh, so th this slide is to answer your, your third question, Christine. So you asked what country needs are addressed uh, by the, uh, the NDC hub. So the, the uh, Pacific Island countries are facing specific challenging regarding their indices. Um, and the Pacific NDC hub tries to provide solutions to those challenges. So the first one is that uh, those countries requested the establishment of the hub because they have limited in-country capacity and they lack economies of scale. So this is mainly due to the small size and remoteness of Pacific countries. So to address this, the NDC Hub is doing capacity building with workshops and in-country trainings, and it provides guidelines. For example, we did a training in July on NDC accounting, and we will do a training uh, in November on the Article 6 of the Paris, uh, the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. And to address uh, the limited in-country capacity, the NDC Hub also provides regional and international experts who can work across countries. So that creates synergies, of, uh, synergies and scale effects between the different countries. So we, have, we are experts in NDC road, uh, roadmap pr preparation, investment planning, and financing, and uh, MRV. And we also have experts with sectoral expertise, so in energy efficiency uh, or in maritime transport, for, for example. And that's, so when we uh, look at these different types of expertise, uh, we, we can, uh, so that, that's why we can provide, for example, investment plans in Fiji and in uh, Kiribati in uh, the energy efficiency sector and in the maritime transport sector, for example. This is because we can provide uh, these types of, uh, of experts to different countries. And uh, the, the third uh, uh, aspect that is, uh, so the, the, the third solution that is brought by the, the Pacific NDC Hub uh, is that we can, so when there is a project or solution that is successful in a Pacific country, 
the NDC Hub helps duplicate and adapt this solution in another country. So that's uh, the needs that uh, the, the NDC Hub is trying to uh, address. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Vincent. Let me exit from your slides here, and that'll stop sharing them. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you so much for, for those presentations, everyone. Thank you to our panelists, and thank you to people who are sending in questions. Before we get to audience questions, I just had uh, one question I wanted to ask of Nilesh and Annette, because you guys, you presented before, we heard about the hub structures, and I, I think you alluded to this a little bit in your your presentations, but could you talk a little bit more about and maybe give us some a specific example of how the regional initiative in your region has directly supported your country? Um, Nilesh, I think you had mentioned a couple of things. You mentioned, I think that the hub was helping feed you with, but could you go into a little bit more detail about specifically what the hub has done to support Fiji? I can't hear you, Nilesh. I think you're muted. There we go. Um, no, good. That, that's a very good question. And I think um, there is so much more that we want the hub to do for us. And, and I think, uh, you know, we're being quite selfish here because, you know, this is home turf. And of course, you know, um, the, the um, hub is here in Fiji. So of course, um, you know, we'd like to exploit, um, you know, the hub and, and, and see, you know, how we can, um, uh, you know, achieve Mexi through the, um, uh, you know, through the regional hub. So I think, you know, in terms of um, the, the support from the hub, so there's obviously been, you know, uh, some um, um, uh, uh, travel support, you know, the hub has given, you know, for example, you know, attending important summits, for example, and, 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 uh, and, and really championing, you know, the, the voice of the hub and, and seeing and really sharing out there with, you know, for example, in you know, regional countries, you know, uh, how, how the hub has sort of, you know, helped us. So that's, that's obviously one way, you know, it has helped in our government and uh, including myself and other sort of, you know, government officials. But other than that, I think, you know, um, uh, it's the capacity building, um, you know, which uh, is, is, is very important and we, we, we continue to benefit from that. And I think Vincent did mention that, um, uh, you know, next month we are going to have, you know, special training on Article 6. And as we know that Article 6 is the only sort of pending item from the Paris rule book, uh, you know, and we hope, you know, that it will, uh, you know, be concluded at COP25 in Chile. So I think, you know, with that sort of, you know, capacity building and really preparing specific negotiators to be able to understand, you know, the, the entire sort of architecture of Article 6 of carbon trading and, and about market mechanisms, I think is very important. And, and, and the reason why I say that is because, you know, we are preparing ourselves, you know, we have, uh, you know, advanced our Red Plus program. We have now, uh, we are now, um, uh, you know, uh, we have now been um, uh, made a member of the, of the Carbon Fund, you know, which is the, Fiji, um, the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility under the Carbon Fund. So we are now a member there and, and which then means that you know, having concluded our negotiation documents and all that couple of other things, we should then be able to receive, you know, some um, uh, you know proceeds from selling uh, you know carbon. So I think that's that's you know quite an advanced stage. You know, we're having the next round of negotiations with the World Bank, you know, next month, and I think you know as we prepare for this and as we prepare for perhaps you know more um, initiatives on on blue carbon on more forestation, uh, you know, programs, we should look at, you know, potentially how the Article 6 and the market mechanisms are going to help us. So I think that's very important. And I think, you know, um, the capacity building is very important. But I think at some stage later, you know, having gone through this first sort of, you know, phase of capacity building, the hub can obviously evolve into, say, you know, providing, you know, some of the capacity um, needs in terms of, you know, if, if countries are wishing to sort of engage in markets, you know, and, and get credit for, for, for selling carbon, what are the, some sort of, some sort of you know, fundamentals we are looking at. So I think you know, the fact that we are starting off with the training is a good step. We are, we are of course, you know, building our experts to, to, to be part of that. That's important. And I think the other important bit which I mentioned was, um, of course, the, the work on uh, the NDC investment planning. So we, of course, have you know, the lead expert here, Vincent. 
Um, so we, we now, of course, have, you know, the other five experts, you know, who will be helping not only us, but at least, you know, there's some other countries in the region who have asked, you know, to do, uh, to do NDC investment plans. So that's, that's um, you know, these are some of the crucial ones. But I think uh, we would like to see some quick runs and, and, and see some results, you know, and, and then, you know, we look forward to, you know, perhaps another you know, uh, phase two planning, and, and then we can, you know, get our um, wish list you know, to the hub. Mm. Um, on, on this, I will I'll just go again, mm -hmm. it will be easier. <laughs> um, on, on this, the, um, the um, yes, the, so we'll have, uh, we'll prepare the second phase mm -hmm. in, in Samoa uh, at the, on the 1st of, of November, and that's when you can uh, suggest um, new mm -hmm. requests for the, for the second phase, which will start on the, First of April uh, 2020, and um, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's uh, we'll try to accumulate as many uh, mm -hmm. as, as many requests, and we'll have a longer period because it mm -hmm. will be from the first of April until uh, 2020 until the end of 2021. Mm -hmm. so we can try to address uh, one or two uh, yeah. requests at that point. No, oh, great, and if I may, you know, also add to that, I think um, the living on the indices is fine, but I think you know. In the process of enhancing indices, if countries have, like, for example, you know, some adaptation initiatives captured in as part of their, you know, NDC, um, 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 you know, NDC plan. So I think that will also be important. And I think, you know, we as a region, you know, the Pacific Seeds, you know, we we have a big focus on adaptation and resilience. And I think this is something, you know, I would suppose you know, a, a breakaway from, you know, mitigation initiatives into looking at more adaptation and resilience. So I think making a business case for adaptation, how do we do that? How do we like, you know, sort of look at conventional development projects and infuse some of the, uh, you know, resilience aspects in that, you know, and that is again, you know, tied to the overall sort of financing framework and you know, other financing strategies, uh, you know, which could be delivered by the hub. So I think these are some of the potential areas of collaboration, you know, with the hub and I, th I think, you know, there's, there's huge opportunities, you know, for, for the hub to deliver in the region in this space. All right, great. Thank you, Nalesh and, and Vincent. I wanted to briefly ask Annette to, to comment on that same question. Um, Annette, can you just speak a little bit about specifically what the assistance that St. Lucia has received from the NDCFI so far, or what your involvement been, and maybe give us some details about how your country has benefited from this regional initiative already? Thanks, um, Chris, Kristen. Um, well, St. Lucia is actually um, co-host, co-organizer, co-owner of the Caribbean NDCFI, as Crispin um, indicated earlier, when we were approached by the UNFCCC jointly to say, you know, how can we help to advance the implementation of NDC in the region? You know, how can we be like a champion um, within the region, you know, OECS together with government of St. Lucia actually jumped in to answer that question. So St. Lucia has been playing a very pivotal role um, with regard to the, the NDC finance initiative within the OECS region. So I think I wear, uh, well, not I think I do wear a double hat <laughs> when it comes to the NDCFI in the Caribbean. But um, with regard to how St. Lucia has been benefiting from this hub, I would say um, in keeping with one of the aims of the NDCFI with regard to strengthening um, technical support and ensuring that we learn from each other within the region, this has been very significant. Um, as it relates to the countries being able to come together to learn from each other and to get other agencies that would normally not be involved in NDC on board. So for example, I mentioned earlier that we, um, St. Lucia has been able to include the finance and economic development departments on board. Prior to that, they did not speak the NDC language. And I think this has been a tremendous benefit to us. And this is coming out more in terms of the work being done through the NDCFI. We have what is called, um, well, we establish what we call working groups 
which basically focus on the, the various sectors that are reflected in the respective NDCs of the countries. So we have working groups um, related to water, to energy, including transport and to other critical infrastructure. And the amount of experience that has been shared through these groups being established where each country, you know, has a representative within the respective working groups. It has been very beneficial in terms of learning from each other, being able to bring other um, agencies on board that were not normally involved in NDC or who are not aware of NDC implementation. So basically the whole issue of peer um, learning, technical strengthening, experience sharing is something that has grown through the NDCFI um, initiative in the Caribbean. The other thing I can point to, and Crispin alluded to this as well, with regard to the technical support that was provided for countries to develop um, project concepts, which was reviewed earlier this week. St. Lucia benefited from this. We are one of the four countries um, that benefited from this. Now, because we had completed our national adaptation plan last year, and through that process, we were able to prioritize the sectors. The sector that came out on top in terms of the prioritization is the water. So we have a water um, sectoral and adaptation plan. And that led us into being able to capitalize on this support, which came through the NDCFI, to look at the development of a water project to try and increase climate resilience within our water sector. Normally, we would not have been able to sit and dedicate the resources to develop this project concept. So we benefited from that um, support with regard to the assignment of a consultant who was able to sit with us. And because of the, the, the benefit we gained from the experience shared with the country, we were able to support the consultant in developing this um, project concept. So while we had the consultant on board because of the experience that we've been sharing amongst us as countries through the NDCFI, we're able to give tremendous support to the, to the consultant in building a very um, substantial concept that reflected our needs at the country level. The other thing that I want to quickly um, point out is that the benefit in terms of the capacity building. Again, Crispin spoke, spoke to the, the, the training on the source project development tool. So whilst we've not moved fully into using this tool, we have built our capacity with regard to how we can use online platforms to build our, um, our project concepts, how we can work together across agencies um, to do this. And I think this is tremendous in terms of the benefit that is coming out of the NDCFI in allowing agencies and countries to see that there is a way to work across the various um, constraints that we have, be it financial, technical, or manpower. And I, I do want to say that, yes, St. Lucia has benefited a lot from the NDCFI, and we definitely look forward to more and greater things um, um, in the future. Okay, great. Thanks, Anna. No, it's great to hear that so much benefit is coming out of this initiative. And I, I think to your first point, it's interesting because we talk a lot about capacity building, but I think a lot of times, you know, the capacity is there, but there's just not enough bandwidth. So when these initiatives are able to bring in sort of consultants and extra manpower, it seems to be really, really useful. Um, the next thing I'll like to do quickly before we get to the audience questions, because we did have a couple come in, I, I wanted to open up this up to the panelists to see if they had any questions for each other, because this um, this session is meant not just to be an educational session for the audience, but also for the panelists in the different regions to exchange information amongst each other. So um, do any of the panelists have a question they would like to ask one of the other panelists? None from you? No? Okay. If not, it's all right. I, I have a stack of questions here myself. <laughs> that I can start from. All right, so let me look at some of the questions that came in from the audience members. All right, so this one is from Courtney Durham, who I know has worked a bit on the Pacific Regional Hub. So hi, Courtney, and thank you for joining us today. Um, Courtney's asking, what policy measures or incentives are proving most attractive to bring in private sector investors for NDC implementation? So I know this is an area that both hubs, I think, are at, at the beginning stages of figuring out how to really bring in these private sector investors. Um, Crispin, I guess I'll, I'll start with you. You had mentioned uh, one of the things that the NDCFI is doing, you know, the matchmaking and the session that you're planning as part of the um, forum next year. 
Do you have any sense, I guess, based on last year's forum of how effective that will be? Or are there other mechanisms that you're using? Or maybe what have you seen in, in other areas that you think will be the most um, attractive measures to bring in private sector investors? Well, I think, to answer that question, I think that uh, I guess I could make a number of points. First of all, the, the conversation we had at our first NDC forum was, was a rather non-traditional one. Historically, you know, governments need to develop and partners and so on, you know, but we, we never had, we never really had a, a meaningful conversation with the private sector about climate change and investment in climate change. So as I indicated earlier at the forum, we had, you know, we had um, representatives from both the regional and international community. So, you know, talking to each other, you know, we even, you know, at, we even had, for example, the, the, the credit union movement in St. Lucia participating and you know, a couple of development banks and so on. Um, well, while one or two of the local the, the development banks have had some experience with climate change um, you know, initiatives, a lot of you know, even the credit union and so on hadn't really had much of that conversation. Some of the investors from outside the region were not quite sure what was, you know, what 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 opportunities there were within the OECS. So that was the first part of the of, you know the first part of, of the the the, the, um, the the puzzle to start to. To work on to get people talking to each other in a, in a non-traditional sort of way, and um, the interest was, was clearly there in in furthering that conversation. Now I mentioned the fact that you know we're going to have PFAN, you know, participating in in the the next forum, and one of the things that that PFAN did was launch a call in in Latin America and the Caribbean, a call for for proposals, and based on on the the, the successful proposals or, or those that were you know were shortlisted, the the um, those who submitted them will be coached and so on, and you know, and they'll actually get a chance to pitch their proposals at the, the, the forum. And happily, we, you know, based on the indications from people, we have got quite a few from the Caribbean itself. So that should be so then people in the position to pitch projects and to see the, what the possibilities are for, for you know for further development, for matchmaking and what have you. So I think I think that's that's a critical component of it. Um, so and so getting the stakeholders that the investors engaged. The, uh, uh, another important aspect of things is really to um, to basically see how you can deepen the conversation between the the, 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 you know, the, the private sector among them themselves. In other words, get them talking, get the banks talking to you know to the potential investors and, and so on. So that that is a key component. So they were not talking to the governments, but talking to, you know among themselves because I think. There was, there was, um, like I said, generally a lack of awareness of, and a lack of interest, a lack of experience in, in investment in the in, in in the climate change sector for, for one of another. So noting, of course, that, that climate change transcends or, or expands, straddles many many sectors. And um, a, another component is the whole, you know, well, I guess it's partly aligned to the second is is having bankable projects, okay, that you know that people can invest in. And you know, potential partners in countries that people can invest in. For example, if it's going to be a private sector investment, say in in um, in say renewable energy, it could be implemented on on a on you know on a on a basis where you invest and, and um, you you make your, your savings on you know you you pay back based on the savings that you incur or you make as a result of that investment. So you know that so it, so there are a number of components of this. And it's, 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 but it's really a multi, a multi, um, multi-dimensional approach to addressing the question. All right, great. Thanks, Kristen. I wanted to ask the same question, I guess, of, of Vincent, um, or maybe Nalesh, if you want to comment on this, or maybe you guys both want to answer. In, in the Pacific, I know that when the Pacific Hub was, was starting up and we were putting together the goals, I know we had talked about wanting to involve the private sector. So how much has been done on the Pacific Hub side as far as involving the private sector, and are there measures that you found have been effective in bringing private sector investments in to assist with NDC implementation? Thanks, Christine. I'll, 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 uh, I'll have a go at this question, and specifically, I'd respond to you know what Courtney had mentioned in terms of private sector uh, participation and what really you know is is the game changer there. So I think I'll speak to one of the examples from Fiji, and this is on. Uh, the, the renewable energy project which we've had, and I, I'm pretty sure you've driven past, you know, you've gone to Nedi Airport by, by road and you would have seen the biomass plant, you know, which is, um, you know, 
sitting out there. So that's that's an absolutely um, amazing investment, but uh, it was rather. Uh, it's it's no longer functional for various reasons. But I think you know there were a number of factors you know that that, that made that investment like massive Korean investors to come in you know invest in the project. First and foremost was that they were able to successfully negotiate a feed-in tariff with the energy company. And we know that you know private sector, whatever venture, whatever they put their money in, they of course you know want some good returns. And so they obviously were able to secure a good feeding tariff, which then allowed them to undertake that investment. But I think fundamentally what failed in that investment was the sustainability side of things. And which is why you know, that massive plant has actually uh, you know, ceased operations. I'm told that they're still paying off staff, but it doesn't make sense. Like how long can you continue to do that? You know, it has ceased operations, I think as of late last year or earlier this year. And, the, and the, one of the reasons uh, you know, which has uh, which we've come to know is is that they were looking at you know the supply of biomass. So that obviously was you know was not like you know uh, strategically planned, and which has then affected the operations of that investment. So can you imagine? I mean, if that was you know something which was you know strategically looked into, there was sustainability of supply, and they had very good tariff rates. Can you imagine? I mean, it's a 12 megawatt you know plant. They would have continued to operate. So I think. You know, a lot of you know lessons I learned from this, and I think um, this is this is something obviously which has come you know a little before our NDC period, but uh, but I think you know some useful lessons are to be learned from uh, you know, from that, particularly if we are to entice private sector. What are some of the things that we need to look at? No, that's um, so. So, so Nishal, uh, Nilesh mentioned one uh, very important aspect, and I think I, I can I can take this uh, this project as um, uh, as an example to to add few uh, few bits on this. So uh, the um, so the private so private companies or private investors are looking for three key aspects. So the first one is to lower the risk, and as you mentioned, if you if you got if you've got a power plant and you've got a problem of uh, of fuel supply. That's um, that, that will be an issue. So if it's uh, biomass or waste, for, for, for example. So the, for, for investors, we, we need to make sure that uh, to show them that uh, there will be enough uh, supply for uh, for whatever they want to uh, they want to do, <coughs> and also that there is uh, that there is a, a market for for the for the project. So if it's electricity, so make sure that there will be enough uh, demand of uh, of electricity. Uh, the second uh, aspect is the, the returns. So the um, so uh, investors will require a certain level of financial returns on uh, on their on their investments. And to help that, we can have a, a grant component which will uh, which will boost the, the the returns of investors and which will make the uh, the investment per se interesting uh, interesting to 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 them. And um, another solution can be to have a subsidized loan for coming from an MDB. So in the Pacific, uh, it could be from uh, uh, the uh, Asian Development Bank, for example, or also from the from the from the GCF. Uh, so we uh, we've talked to, uh, about uh, risks, uh, returns, and also scale because that's uh, that's a, a big um, uh, issue in uh, in the Pacific because we are, so we are talking about small island countries so by mm -hmm. definition they are, they have small markets too and uh, for for a private company to come in, uh, in 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 a small market it's it's more difficult because it's there are a lot of development costs uh, to to get in and then uh, they don't have uh, enough scale in the market to uh, to uh, reimburse for example those uh, those uh, initial initial costs so one Solution can be to look at it from a regional perspective and to try to showcase a project that can be uh, developed and implemented in several countries in the in the Pacific, mm -hmm. and that's what we are also trying to do uh, with the um, uh, with the, the Pacific and Okay, great. Thank you. Um, that's actually a great segue into my next question, but I did want to ask Annette if she had any any comments she wanted to add on that, either from your NDCFI hat or your St. Lucia hat. Um, yes, thanks, Chris, Chris, Christine. Uh, <laughs> yes, we're, we're over here. <laughs> and you're sitting too close together. <laughs> um, actually, yes, I wanted to add the um, the country perspective with regard to incentives or policy measures um, in terms of attracting the private sector. Um, 
but first we have to be very clear in indicating that the private sector within our region is quite different from the private sector um, of developed countries, um, for example. So within the Caribbean, within our region, private sector is basically about business and survival. And uh, at the wider scale in terms of, you know, the wider international um, level, it could be perceived as um, where you can get support or investment opportunities. So that is the first thing we have to be um, clear on with regard to private sector within our region. Um, so at the national level, what I can indicate is, for example, um, St. Lucia has been able to offer incentives to the private sector for investment in renewable energy and energy efficiency um, um, interventions, for example. And the other thing, um, policy-wise, is we have developed what we call a climate change private sector engagement strategy. And basically, with this strategy, and again, this was done on our national adaptation um, plan process, where, as I indicated that the earlier, the private sector needs to be more involved in what we are doing in terms of climate resilience, building and NDC implementation. So with this private sector engagement strategy that we develop, bringing the private sector into the conversation and giving them a more powerful voice, um, basically being able to communicate to them the impact and responsibility that they have in contributing to building um, climate resilience at the national level and to basically contextualize their expectations because primarily when you talk to the private sector in our region, they will tell you it's the government's responsibility with regard to helping to guard against the impacts of climate change at the national level. So helping them or getting them to understand the critical role that they as the private sector play is very important if we are going to move forward in terms of building you know, climate resilience at the national level. So I just wanted to bring that into the picture from the national um, perspective. And of course, we can see readily you know, the linkages with what the hubs are alluding to. So I just wanted to add that bit, thanks. Okay, thank you, Annette. Oh, gosh, we only have a few minutes left, and I have to say there's lots of good questions. Yes? Uh, Nilesh had uh, wanted to add something on. Okay, on sure, go ahead. Uh, hi, um, Christine and everyone. So, you know, I mean, talking about private sector, and I think, you know, this is a point of which I mentioned earlier, but I think it's very fitting, you know, for, for me to, you know, raise it again. And this is about, you know, removing the legal impediments. Like, for example, I mean, if we look at, like, you know, the Electricity Act for Fiji, I mean, it does not you know, uh, it, it prevents, you know, independent power producers. So for example, I mean, if we do a legal review and, and, and which is indeed the case, I mean, we are undergoing a review of the legislation. So again, you know, with the intention that, you know, it will, it will be quite progressive. It will create room for private sector investment and particularly IPPs. So I think, you know, once we fix the legislation and create that sort of legal, uh, get the legal enablers right, I think that in itself sends a very, very strong signal to the private sector. To undertake investments. That's the point I wanted to mention here. Yeah. And, and so I will add one last point, but it will last less less than one minute. Uh, we are so the the the, um, the NDC hub has also um, uh, released uh, um, a, a, a guide to green entrepreneurship uh, that uh, that can be so that, that focuses on Fiji, Vanuatu, and Kiribati. Mm -hmm. And we are currently translating uh, the, those, those guides uh, into local languages. Great, thank you, Vincent. Oh, there's so much to talk about, but I, I think I'll ask everyone to, to sum up and maybe I'll, I'll go around the room and just ask everyone to respond very briefly to this last question because we just have about uh, five minutes left. I mean, I, we've discussed many different aspects here and one thing that we didn't get into too much that was interesting to me, I thought, was just the, um, you know, sort of the contrast between the, the two hubs in terms of how they're set up. I think that both hubs seem to have quite similar um, goals and actually there's a lot of similarities in how they're meeting those goals, but how the structure is set up is, is a bit different because in the Caribbean we have an existing regional organization, the OECS, of course in partnership with St. Lucia, but that's sort of, you know, um, facilitating this whole effort, whereas in the Pacific you don't necessarily have that and you have a steering committee made up of um, of government representatives, for example. So I think it would be interesting to discuss that further. But the question I wanted to finish with is, to the panels, is, is this discussion useful to, to you as a representative of, of the hub and of a country? So is this discussion useful, yes or no? And if so, 
what aspects of it do you think would be most important to, to continue discussing and, and how can we do that? Do you have ideas on whether it would be useful and how we would continue to, um, to have this exchange between the Caribbean and the Pacific? And I'll start with Vincent because you're on screen. You're muted, Vincent. I can't hear you. But just very quickly, right? Because we just have about five minutes left. Okay, so so yes, so first yes, this uh, conversation is extremely extremely useful because uh, as as we could see during our, our discussions, there uh, there are uh, many uh, similar challenges that um, island countries face uh, in the Caribbean or in the Pacific. Um, so they uh, they are they face uh, more dangers from climate change than other countries. They are more willing to act against climate change, and also there are some specific sectors that we don't see in other countries. So for example, the the maritime transport uh, sector. So these uh, are areas where we could uh, exchange um, uh, knowledge uh, between the two, the two regions. And in terms of how, I think a good, um, so we, we could, so first uh, the, um, uh, so we, we got a newsletter in the, in the, uh, of, of the Pacific and DC Hub, so you, our, Carib our Caribbean colleagues could uh, subscribe to it to see what's going on here. And uh, on a more uh, formalized um, aspect, we could maybe uh, in, in start um, a virtual meeting between uh, the two regions every, every two months to discuss what we have done and what, uh, so to, to share lessons uh, learned around what we, what we are doing. Okay, great. Maybe you want to move the camera over and see if Nilesh has anything to say on that topic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Christian, this is good, and I think you know the, the two regions to be in, uh, you know, to be understanding, to be uh, to be in the know of you know what we are doing, you know, in our various places. I think is very important, you know. And, and and I come from really, you know, I mean, I'm very grounded in the reality, and I would like to see a lot of you know movement in the NDC, you know, investment space, you know, investment planning space, you know, um, you know, planning uh, space, and you know the the on the ground implementation stuff. And I think of more interest to me would be, I mean, if we are able to draw some commonalities between the NDCs we have, you know, in the Pacific and those in the Caribbean region, and how some advancements have been made. For example, if you've been able to make, you know, sort of uh, attract some fundamental investments, you know, in renewable energy sector, how have you been able to do that? You know, what were some of the plus points there? You know, so some of these experiences, I mean, if it comes in like, you know, whether it's a, it's a bulletin, or whether you have you know some virtual summits like this which is always very welcome you know to share experiences but i, th I think the other the other fundamental point is about you know all this financing work and all that you know how we are making innovations in this space how we are trying to sort of you know leverage on domestic you know uh, public sector finance to you know perhaps you know getting more investments um you know in this space and more important you know i guess would be what are we doing about adaptation projects how are we you know, uh, shifting the needle on, on adaptation needs in the region. I think this is something both, you know, uh, in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, I think this is fundamental. And I think the more we sort of, you know, hear from each other, share our experiences, and I, I think that's, that's the way to go, yeah. Great, thank you. Annette, go to you. Any final comments on that last question? Yes, definitely. I think this is a very great experience. And I think the fact that I'm sitting here right now, whilst one of my favorite TV series is playing, is evidence enough that, you know, this is a very useful conversation. And I'm looking forward very much to a repeat of this in one way or another, be it virtual or face to face. But I think as small island developing states, there's a lot that we can learn. Um, from each other. We, um, with regard to the hubs, we are relatively two young um, entities and at this stage I believe in terms of, you know, being able to share the experience with each other is very important. It can help us to be more efficient in what we're doing to meet the expectations of the members of the hubs, the respective hubs. It will help us to remain transparent in what we're doing and I think it will be a good indication to our um, partners and potential partners out there that we are very serious about addressing our issues within small island developing states, notwithstanding our constraints, our challenges, our circumstances. So definitely, you know, this is something that I am very excited about and I look forward to other um, opportunities where we can continue to share with our colleagues within the Pacific and how we can move forward with meeting our commitments and overcoming our challenges. 
All right, thank you. And I'm sorry you had to miss your favorite TV program, but I'm glad that you decided to spend the time here with us. Uh, Crispin? Thanks. Um, thank you. I have the last word, apparently. Uh, I think, yeah, this has been extremely, extremely useful. And, you know, I've learned a lot about, you know, um, a couple aspects. One, the, the governance structure, something, you know, the, the difference between the governance structures and also the resource mobilization models. I think it's, it's, you know, it's very, very interesting. It's something I'd like to learn more about. I think I see opportunities for not just documenting best practice and exchanging and so on, you know, but I think also the hubs are coming into their own at a very interesting juncture when our, our respective member states are now looking at, at revising their NDCs. And so I think they can play a useful role in helping to, in basically synthesizing, getting an understanding of what our, you know, what's happening in our region with, you know, how our, our, our countries are seeking to, you know, to, to make their NDCs more ambitious or, or to, you know, to, to as, as called for under the, the, um, the, the Paris Agreement. And I think the possibility also exists for us to do some work together. You know, like some, I, I don't see anything stopping us from, from having joint initiatives. So, you know, I, again, I say this has been extremely useful and I see a, 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 a wide range of possibilities. Great, thank you, Crispin. Yeah, I think it's clear that there's opportunity and desire to not only share information between the countries, but also between, but between the hubs. And one of the things that we didn't quite get into today, but there were some questions about are what can be done at a regional level. You know, what the hubs, I think, are both helping countries individually, but also trying to do initiatives um, regionally. Nilesh had mentioned um, what, one idea around that. So I think that's definitely an idea we could talk about further. Uh, but unfortunately, we're out of time today. So I wanted to say thank you very much for the panelists for spending time with us here today. I also want to thank Island Innovation and James Ellsmore for setting up this, this event. I think you know what we're talking about here, sharing information between two regions that are vastly um, far away from each other geographically is really the, the type of thing that this event can, can help with. And I think we need to do this more. So I think this has been quite a successful uh, summit, but we'll take the lessons learned from it and, and hopefully do it again soon. So again, thank you very much to our audience members as well. I'm sorry we didn't get to all your questions, but hopefully we'll keep the conversation going and we'll let you know how that will happen. So take care, everyone. Thanks for being with us and have a good evening or day, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.